here we go. All right, welcome everyone. Good to see you today. My name is Justin Carter. I'm a project associate with the Center for Rural Affairs, and I'd like to welcome you to our series, Models of Native Cooperative Ownership. Uh, this is a series that we've been holding a little bit all throughout this year. We got started in the summer and went into the fall, and then we got some opportunities to hold some more sessions right now before the end of the year. Um, we've had some tremendous speakers, and today we're lucky enough to have Dwayne Wilson with us from Arctic Cooperatives um, up in Canada, actually. So it's really exciting. Thank you so much for being here, Dwayne. Um, if you're not familiar with the Center for Rural Affairs, we're a small nonprofit. We, uh, we do a variety of projects in rural communities from lending services to grassroots food and farm work uh, to rural policy work. And we have uh, programs and staff um, in the tribal communities of Omaha Nation and also uh, Santee Sioux Nation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our facilitator, facilitator for today, Pamela Standing. It's been so great working with Pamela. Pamela joins us from the Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance, and I'll turn the floor over to her. We're just happy to have everyone here today, and um, we're really excited to hear from Duane. And uh, the Arctic Cooperatives is an amazing, amazing organization. And what they've been able to accomplish all the years that they've been open is, is such a wonderful model. And they're bringing food into communities that historically were not able to get food in there before and the communities own them. So they, they're, I'm gonna let Dwayne explain everything. We just wanna welcome you, Dwayne, and you can go ahead and get started. And just thank you for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Pamela. And I'll, I'll maybe just uh, open up by saying if you were expecting some some ultra slick presentation. I, I hate to disappoint you. I'm, my name's Dwayne. Uh, I live in Winnipeg and, and work for, for Arctic Co-ops. And uh, I'm you know, really kind of proud and humbled to share some of Arctic Co-ops story. But uh, before I go on and start sharing screen, I think it's appropriate to, for me to acknowledge here that uh, here at Arctic Co-ops, we're located in Winnipeg which is on uh, Treaty One land, uh, the unceded territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and homeland of the, the Métis Nation. So uh, it's important to acknowledge that, you know, Arctic Co-ops is uh, an indigenous, an indigenous organization, a, a support federation, a cooperative service federation. And uh, it's always important to remember, you know, remember our roots and remember who we serve. So. Uh, with that, I will start sharing screen. Uh, bear with me one quick sec. It says I've got a warning that it's going to stop the sound share, and I'm going to continue if that's okay, Pamela. Yes. Okay. All right. Oh. That's not what I was expecting to see. Is that your screen? That's yours. Really? I've got the Center for Rural Affairs up in mine. Are you seeing a slide that says Arctic Co-op? Yes, we are. Okay, fantastic. Well, we can work with that because I've got, I've got the luxury of having two screens here. So uh, I don't know how you would like to manage questions. I can be fairly flexible either way. I'll maybe just ask Pamela uh, if we can handle it however you wish. If you want to stop me and monitor kind of the raise hand functions just so we're not talking over one another. If that's okay with you, that's fine with me. That sounds good. And if okay. people have questions, just put them in the chat and I'll be, Justin and I will be watching the chat. Super, super. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. I was kind of explaining to Justin and Pamela at the start that, you know, as a cooperative, you know, we, basically manage and govern this business aligned with the seven co-op principles. And one of them is training, education, and information. So uh, we were kind of joking a little bit that I'm, I'm either gullible or just very aligned with that. And it could be, it could, we, could be equal measures of each, but we really feel that, you know, training, education, and information is one of our principles. So uh, we need to act consistent with what 
we say we are and we are a cooperative and that's you know an important principle so it's easy to to get to yes so um I'll maybe talk about what a cooperative is first, because this is one of the things that uh, that I think is not necessarily, you know, when it comes to cooperative development is, you know, maybe one of the things that's least understood. Oftentimes cooperatives are born out of market failure where, you know, the needs of a community uh, are not met by, by the market, you know, so whether it's in a retail cooperative in the Arctic, or whether it's a credit union in the heart of Africa, oftentimes the same the same circumstances beget the creation of a cooperative. So, but really foundationally, I want to talk about what a cooperative is. So, and I, I'm going to emphasize key words because you're going to see the connection between the definition of a cooperative and cooperative principles. So, you know, a cooperative is, and I apologize for reading right off screen, but it is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet their common economic, social, and cultural needs and aspirations through a jointly owned and democratically controlled enterprise. So you're really ultimately at the heart of it, a cooperative is there to meet people's needs. And that's why cooperatives take so many forms from worker co-ops to childcare co-ops, to retail co-ops, to energy co-ops, to water co-ops, to credit unions, et cetera. And in the case of the communities of the Arctic, they had very specific needs. And I'm going to share as we go through the presentation, how the needs of those communities, both you know, back in, you know, the early days of cooperative development in the Arctic back in the, you know, late 1950s and into the 60s and into the early 70s have gradually morphed over time as the needs and communities have changed. Because ultimately, while this is the definition of a cooperative, I very much look at cooperative development and the growth of the co-op system in Canada's Arctic as being an example of collective entrepreneurship because that's really what it is. You've got very remote, sparsely populated communities that the market doesn't meet their needs, partly because whether it's capital, whether it's human resources, or whether it's for other reasons, there isn't the critical mass to create and to sustain uh, some businesses using purely a private enterprise or you know, kind of an entrepreneurship model. But communities can rally together to, to do entrepreneurship collectively. And that's really what, that's really, really what they've done. And they have chosen to do this through cooperatives. And I remember on many, many occasions listening to Arctic Co-op's longtime elected president, a gentleman by the name of Bill Lyle out of Iklatutiak or Cambridge Bay, as it's known, uh, Nunavut, talk about about the alignment between traditional Inuit societal values and cooperative principles uh, and the cooperative business model. Because you know, what he would offer up is a perspective that said, it's only natural. We've been able to live in this harsh Arctic environment for thousands of years. How? By working together. The best hunters hunted for everybody, the best gatherers gathered for everybody, the best seamstresses sewed for everybody. And they really had a kind of a communal and very nomadic way of living. So as, the, as time went on and for various reasons, uh, colonialism surrounded by, natural, by a national defense project, surrounded by, um, coming together for the provision of government services, et cetera, they really saw it just as an extension of, you know, trying to meld the way they had been able to live together for thousands of years into, you know, kind of a new economy. And so these cooperatives that value self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, equality, equity, and solidarity, really had this great uh, alignment. And for anyone that's interested, uh, there's actually a, a book authored about uh, Bill 
and his history in, in Inuit leadership and governance. And I think the title is very telling. Uh, the title is Helping Ourselves by Helping One Another. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very good thought process and spirit to bring to any discussion about collective entrepreneurship and cooperative business. So maybe I'll just pause there. That's, I kind of hit that a little bit like a machine gun. Is there, is there, does that, is there any questions in the chat, Pamela, or, or hands up while I grab a drink of water? Not at this time. Okay, I then I will. One well, thing, Dwayne, I was just yes. gonna mention, um, your presentation, we can see it fine, but it isn't in present mode. We can see the slides oh, okay. in the left-hand bar, bar. Just wanted to let you know. Okay, well, here, let me try this then. Is that a little better? Yeah, yes. Okay, very good. You know, I don't use the notes anyway, so I really, you're just say, protecting me from myself as it pertains to uh, not <laughs> conflicting. <laughs> And unfortunately, you know, because this is uh, being recorded, of course, though, that's that's now saved to be shared on YouTube into eternity. But that's OK. We're all human, right? Yes. Uh, so uh, I talked a little bit earlier. I made reference to, you know, the, the co-op principle of training, ed education and information uh, and that of cooperation among cooperatives. But I'll, I'll go through through each of them, each of them. And. I think you'll see the tie back to many of the elements that were discussed in the, the definition of a cooperative. So, so the seven co-op principles uh, in no particular order, no rank order are voluntary and open membership. And this principle is really about, you know, the cooperative and participation in the cooperative is really open to, you know, anyone that wants to, um, wants to fulfill the, the responsibility of, of, of being a member. And normally the, the, you know, the nominal, you know, basically the, the introductory, uh, you know, the, the, in, the initial share in a co-op is set to be a very, very low barrier. You know, often, oftentimes, depending on the individual co-ops bylaws, it might be, you know, a nominal sum of $5 or $10. And that's really, uh, all that's required to, to become a, a co-op member. Uh, the second is democratic member control. So democratic member control in, in the co-ops, uh, in, in our co-op system manifests itself in one member, one vote, and it really reflects itself in two primary areas. One is the election of directors. So each autonomous and independent co-op, and we're going to get into autonomy and independence when we get to, to principle number four, is an autonomous and independent community-owned business. And the directors elected to, to govern and set direction for that cooperative are peers from among the community. It's often community leaders. And they will, it's probably no coincidence that many cooperative directors go on to be to serve as members of the legislative assembly or other you know important roles in in governance uh, it's it's very hard to to really determine whether you know which is the you know whether you want to use a chicken and egg or a cart horse analogy to say that you know these people maybe they have you know innate leadership qualities and the same qualities that lead them to be elected by the other members in the community to lead their co-op are the same attributes that make them very electable from a, you know, from the perspective of the territorial government. Or, you know, there's another perspective that says, you know, because one of our principles is, is training, education, and information that perhaps the training, education, and information that those elected directors receive whether it's reading financial statements, running an effective meeting, uh, long-term planning, et cetera, you know, maybe help equip them to be better serve their people in other capacities. And I don't really have an opinion. It's probably, it's probably some of both to be quite honest with you. But so the local directors not only direct the activities of their local uh, independent co-op, they are elected from among the membership. 
But the other aspect of democratic member control relates to uh, the changing of bylaws. So the bylaws are kind of the, the, the rules by which the co-op has set up for itself. And that's a little bit of a check and balance that makes the, 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 the bylaws for the co-op that can't be changed without approval of the membership. So really this is the opportunity for um, broad representation from the community to ensure that the co-op is being operated in such a way that it's going to meet their, meet their ongoing needs. The third is, is member economic participation. So, you know, member economic participation, uh, in essence, is that, you know, the expectation that members will support their co-op. And then if there are returns, you know, then they are distributed in proportion to that economic participation. So essentially, whatever business activity is driving the profitability of, of their co-op, that's the same, you know, in that proportion is how the return is, is, uh, is delivered. So, you know, I think it's really interesting that it's a really interesting dynamic that, you know, and I, I'm, I may get into it later, because this is something that I really am passionate about advocating for is, especially in small communities, the likes that we serve, an economist would say that competition is destructive, that the costs of, del of duplication of services, of duplication of infrastructure, et cetera, actually cost more than the benefit of competition, that communities like these are best served by a monopoly. And of course, when you've got people that because of geography, because of the fact that communities aren't interconnected because of limitations on their financial capacity don't have the ability to to make other choices and are left to deal strictly with what the monopoly offers them you're really at risk of that monopoly position being abused and to me the cooperative model is one that where you've got the owners and the users of the services are the same people, you will find that natural balance, you will find that harmony that ensures that, you know, pricing and services and the level of training in the staff and the compensation for the staff is finding that balance between the ongoing need of having a viable business because the same people are owners with running that business uh, efficiently and but uh, and offering prices that are that are fair because there isn't that that power imbalance between owners and consumers because they're the same people and when you're in a when you're in a model where you know we we don't actually use the word profit in our in our financial statements uh, the term that we use is net savings and really what that represents is the economic benefit that's been saved by people in using the cooperative business model versus the other choices that they might have. So, you know, the example in the in the imagery is I, I probably need to update it because 2017 is starting to get a little bit long in the tooth. But on an annualized basis, Arctic Cooperatives is a cooperative. It's a cooperative that's owned by 32 other co-ops, and we'll we'll get into that. That structure a little bit uh, a little bit later in the presentation but as a cooperative we return our net savings as a service federation to member co-ops in proportion to the business they've transacted with their service federation and what that's doing is that's putting that economic that economic whether you want to call it a return whether you want to call it capacity there's probably different interchangeable terms that you could use it's now returning it to the community level for each of those autonomous and independent co-ops that have locally elected directors to be deciding what, how that is used, whether it is economic, you know, an economic uh, changes the economic such that prices lo are lower, whether it's an investment in a 
in you know improving their facilities or whether it's investments in training or whether it's scholarships or it basically turns it right back uh, so that local locally elected individuals are making decisions with those resources for local outcomes and we kind of have this little bit of a uh, I don't want to call it a catchphrase that maybe diminishes you know the 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 importance of this as a thought process but looking for opportunities where we would centralize for efficiency but localize for effectiveness and this is a perfect example of that where you know you, we can do all sorts of things coordinating logistics etc on a very macro scale dealing with 32 communities and ultimately the economic benefit that's derived is returned back to those same communities to meet their own unique uh, their own unique needs and they're based on their own unique priorities the the fourth uh, the fourth co-op principle is autonomy and independence and i've touched on this a couple of times already that even though there is that looking to centralize for efficiency it's never done uh, it's never done in a in a way that is diminishing the local autonomy and independence of that individual co-op so it's it's really a great example i think of you know the the centralization of some key services for efficiency sake in a lot of respects actually promotes the the autonomy and independence of of co-ops because it really it really de-risks their local business and allows them to you know certainly be be more sustainable to do an ever better job at meeting those unique needs that i that i referred to uh, the last three principles are education training and information i think i've i've talked about that a little bit and and you know, it, it's, it comes to mind pretty easily because it is a big part of, of what we do. And uh, particularly around things like, if I look, for example, at, you know, the organization's vision statement, which is people working together to improve their social and economic well-being. And I look at the amount of time and effort, for example, that we would put into education training and information about things like snowmobile and atv repair just as an example that if you were purely using some of the metrics that you know i learned when i went to university about cost benefit analysis about roi you know return on assets etc you would probably never get to a point that you were investing the amount of time and effort and and resources in education around and training around small engine repair. But when you put the lens on and you, you interpret the vision statement as looking to, to contribute to people's social and economic well being, and you recognize that people's ability to get out on the land, people's ability per, to pursue traditional activities around um, hunting and gathering is a contribution to social well-being mm -hmm. and potentially to food security which is certainly connected to their economic well-being it's very easy to get to yes when you put that lens on and you would never get to yes if you were just looking at the dollars and cents of it and you know as somebody who's got now 23 years in cooperative business but had time before that in that you know kind of publicly traded publicly traded company and having gone through, you know, kind of a multi-year high honors program in commerce, we never talked about those things at all. It was all about those other metrics, cost benefit, ROI, net present value of money, et cetera. And, and I've got to tell you, as a person, you know, as a person, I feel liberated and empowered to make decisions that have these qualitative aspects to it as opposed to purely being quantitative because it's easy to quantify money costs and sales and margins and you know profits or you know net savings if you if you choose to use that word but when we can make these decisions with a with a qualitative lens about how it's contributing to pursuing a traditional lifestyle 
those are the things that make me feel good. And I think they make many of our people feel, you know, many of our employees feel good. And that's, that's powerful stuff. The, the last two co-op principles, cooperation among cooperatives, that manifests itself in several different ways. Uh, you know, Arctic co-ops, our largest, our largest supplier is Federated Cooperatives Limited. We're a member owner. Uh, our insurance is through Cooperators Group. And, you know, our prepaid, our prepaid uh, visa product is through Van City Credit Union. So, you know, generally speaking, the cooperative the cooperative pricing, uh, pricing just very, you know, at a very basic level is you sell goods at market competitive prices and you return the surplus to the member owners in the form of patronage dividends and cash back. You know, that applies to, you know, that general philosophy should apply to, you know, a, a co-op in Whale Cove, but it also applies to cooperative enterprises operating in the financial services sector. It also applies to cooperative enterprises opera, operating in the insurance sector. So, and the wholesale supply uh, sector as well. So it only stands to reason that we should be able to find out, though, find, you know, seek out those cooperative businesses that are operating in a competitive market and have competitively priced goods and services and make the conscious decision to, 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 use use those organizations because it contributes to you know a, a better you know really a a stronger cooperative economy and the last one the last one and certainly not least is uh, concern for community and concern for community can have certainly a number of different interpretations you know one is food security mental health uh, concern for community would speak to environmental efforts. So uh, again, you know, being able to be unshackled by, you know, the traditional measurements of cost benefit, et cetera, and really look and make decisions along the lines of what's good for, for the community is, is really empowering. And part of our evolution as an organization has included the implementation of a standard of a, a pardon me a balanced scorecard where we are trying to balance off you know does the organization have financial needs absolutely it does it needs to be viable if it's going to continue but it's also got measure it's also got equally weighted measurements around uh, social good around people you know, investments in training and, and other elements that really position us to not sacrifice, you know, people because of financial pressures or not sacrifice, you know, the commitment to doing social good uh, because of something else. And, and like I say, as somebody who has spent a number of years in that publicly traded world, where the, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the term, the tyranny of the quarter. You know, it's kind of a term where, you know, a lot of publicly traded companies fall into the trap of making short-term decisions because they're all geared about what the quarterly dividend is, what the stock price is. And because cooperatives aren't created for that purpose, they're created to meet people's needs. And you know, those locally elected directors, they have the foresight to know that, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter as much where we're at three months from now when the next, you know, when the next quarterly financial statements come out, we're building this for our children and for our grandchildren. So we need to govern it with a more of a long-term view. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the cooperative business model historically has proven to have higher success rates than others. And I think it's for those two reasons. They are making decisions generally for the longer term. And be, if they're member focused and focused on meeting people's needs, as long as they are meeting people's evolving needs and 
always aspiring to meet those needs better and better, they've got a more, they've, they've got what drives those businesses, I think is naturally more sustainable than some other business models out there. I'll pause for water again. Dwayne, I have a quick question. Um, sure. It's about the word profit. Is that a choice that was made by the community to not call it profits, but net savings? I mean, you know, I really I, like that. I, I don't think I, I, I can't really answer that. <clears throat> and, and the reason I say that is because, you know, I, I spent uh, I spent nine years at Federated Co-op before I came to Arctic Co-op, and it was always net savings at Federated as well. I think it's just a, uh, you know, it's a term that in my co-op experience seems to be fairly universally adopted. And, you know, there, there has to be some, you know, there has to be, there's a, always a little bit of, a little bit of training and coaching because we, Obviously, we're a business that you know has common needs for logistics and finance and HR and IT, just like many, many other businesses. So, you know, the talent we attract has the subject matter expertise of those functional areas, but not necessarily any background in cooperatives. So, you know, a profit isn't a dirty word. A, you know, a co-op or any other business needs to to have one to survive, to see next year and the year after and the year after. Uh, but it's really just a perspective of, you know, what that really represents and you know, really what it represents in a, in a competitive market where people are making a decision to purchase from their co-op versus their other options. It really represents the amount that the members have saved collectively by making that choice. Thank you. Okay, so I'll I'll carry right on to a little bit of, a little bit of history about you know how, how where where the organization started from and how it got to here. So as I'd mentioned earlier, you know the the population in the Arctic largely lived a nomadic lifestyle prior to probably about the 1950s. And in the 1950s, there started to be a settle, settlements in communities. You know, prior to that, there was a few trading posts operated by the Hudson's Bay Company, where um, where you know the people would you know come to the trading post seasonally, trade furs for staple goods, and that was what commerce looked like. So. As the community started to form around either the uh, the distant, uh, it, you know, the, it was called the dew line sites, distant early warning sites, which were a series of radar sites that were set up during the Cold War that spanned across really northern Canada and including Alaska to alert to any any sort of incursions that might be coming over the top of the globe from from you know Russia or other Eastern Bloc countries. Between that and the assimilation of people into communities for the provision of basic health or education services, now people were together in a place instead of leading this nomadic lifestyle. And you know, because it was consistent with, with the way they had lived forever, they were, you know, really not, not very satisfied with the monopoly position of of the, you know, the the, the really the sole purveyor of commerce in the in the uh, in the area so they decided to create cooperatives and to say these cooperatives had very humble beginnings would be probably uh, a gross understatement in a lot of cases the co-ops you know retailing in the arctic back in you know the 1950s and 1960s was a very rudimentary exercise uh, there was no refrigeration. There was no, you know, never mind internet. There weren't even telephone lines or fax machines. So they, the co-ops, oftentimes were built out of scavenged material or perhaps an abandoned building from the dew line site that they might have 
literally dragged across the the ice and the tundra and they sold shelf stable goods and they worked together and and reinvested in the business that that they owned and what they came to realize is the same spirit that saw the creation of the cooperative in the first place the the notion that they could do better together than they could alone you know early co-op leaders had the foresight to take that that thought and take that spirit and and really grow it to look at something even bigger and they you know imagined that if they could succeed better in the provision of of key goods and services at the local level better by working together, then it only stood to reason that if they pooled their resources together as cooperatives, just like they did as individuals at the community level, you could create a community of communities that could help one another. So that's what they did. And in 1972, uh, the precursor of Arctic cooperatives was formed with 26 founding cooperatives that basically had that vision of having the community of communities to support one another. And they created Canadian Arctic Co-op Federation Limited. So largely in parallel to that, uh, actually a little bit before that in 1965, there was actually an art marketing company slash cooperative that was that was created called Canadian Arctic Producers. And it was a partnership between many of these same independent co-ops and the federal government and Canadian Arctic producers, you know, marketed Inuit and Dene art. And eventually it things aligned that the very same co-ops that owned Canadian Arctic Co-op Federation Limited also owned part of Canadian Arctic producers with the federal government. And the co-op saw fit that they started the process of getting the federal government out of their out of their enterprise. And once they did, they, you know, from an efficiency perspective, they brought Canadian Arctic producers together with Canadian Arctic Co-op Federation Limited and merged them together and renamed it at that time, uh, Arctic Cooperatives Limited as it's known today. So uh, officially Arctic Co-ops has, Arctic Cooperatives Limited has existed since 1982. But in reality, it predates that back to 1972, uh, which means that uh, early in 2022, on, on 2 to 22 actually, we're going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary. So that's uh, quite a milestone. And one of the, as you saw from the modest beginnings of member co-ops, and you'll remember back to me talking about co-op bylaws and how you know, many of the co-ops have kind of that nominal share being priced at five or ten dollars. And you know, some of these communities have as little as 70 to 100 people in them. So as you can imagine, if you pair out the children and just look at the adult population and you collect even if everyone was a member and you collected five or ten dollars, you don't really have much to 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 go on to set up a local business. So access to capital has been one of the impediments to growth for uh, co-ops in Canada's Arctic for, for many, many years. And with some, with some seed capital from the territorial government of the day and the transferring of some, some uh, a portfolio of, of loans with co-ops, in 1986, the Northwest Territories Cooperative Business Development Fund was created. And after 1999, when the territory of Northwest Territory split into two to become Northwest Territories and Nunavut, the fund was renamed to the Arctic Co-ops Development Fund. And essentially, it is, being, it is a fund that the co-ops administer, uh, administer together for themselves and for one another. And it has loaned out for whether it's interim financing for co-op projects, whether it's consolidation of debt and refinancing, whether it's for the annual uh, resupply. And I've got some imagery a little bit later on about some of our supply chain challenges. And I think they would help drive home 
how the concept of just-in-time delivery when you're talking about marine shipping to an Arctic environment is very different than you would than a, a grocer in, in Southern Canada or, or the United States for that matter would, would contend with. But one of the very key activities of the Arctic Co-op Development Fund is helping to fund that inventory purchase when you've got such a difference between when you need to pay for your inventory and when you actually get the cash in the till to pay for it. And over the course of the last you know, 30 plus years, that, fund, that revolving fund uh, owned and directed by these same member co-ops has lent out over $600 million to one another to help support their ongoing activities and their growth. So now, you know, before I, you know, that that's kind of how co-ops got to, you know, on an individual basis to, to form in communities and how they came together. And I'll talk now a little bit more of you know, where they're at today. So uh, Arctic Co-ops is a cooperative service federation, as I've said, owned by these 32 co-ops and from our board of directors is uh, an affirmation of these this vision and this mission statement and uh, i talked earlier about the feel good of you know working for a business that doesn't just have qual you know quantitative measures of profitability but qualitative ones and i think these especially the vision statement speaks to this where you know the vision that the cooperatives share is that of working together to improve their economic and social well-being so you know the an important an important acknowledgement that these are not just this is not just an economic enterprise but it's got an aspect of considering people's social well-being in what it does and you know a clear example you know that i'll tie back again just to something as simple as training education information around something that reduces a barrier to a traditional cultural activity, uh, traditional means of feeding themselves, uh, even our commitment to the art industry, that certainly the viability of that has been difficult. So if you're purely using the economic measure, you probably would have thrown in the towel. But when you put that, that social lens on and the important connection to, you know, culture and history and tradition that, that the art has, uh, you know, we arrive at different decisions than you might otherwise. And then that becomes the, the mission of the organization is how do we go about fulfilling that, that vision? And it's by providing service to and enable cooperation among the multi-purpose cooperative businesses in Canada's North. And we'll see very shortly about how, what multi-purpose looks like. And It'll, I think it will bring you back to some of my earlier statements about collective entrepreneurship. So this is what our network looks like today. 32 autonomous co-ops that cover 20% of Canada's land mass. You could probably plop Europe into this area and it would all fit. And there's only 100,000 people spread out across Canada's entire north. So, uh, you know, when you talked earlier, uh, you know, Pamela and Justin and used the term remote, uh, I get it <laughs> because it's remote and every one of these communities save to has no road. They are fly in, fly out or marine service. So when I started with Arctic Co-op, I actually headed up the procurement and logistics and I sometimes wonder why you know, how I still have any hair, you know, dealing with the dealing with the logistical challenges of, of, uh, of, you know, supplying, supplying goods of all types via those modes of transportation to communities that small. But it's, uh, I've got to tell you that, you know, again, hearkening back to, you know, that qualitative versus quantitative measure, the degree of satisfaction of doing something that's harder is immensely, immensely more gratifying. So if you think back to the you know, couple slides ago about the pretty humble beginnings of, 
of co-ops in Canada's Arctic, it's actually quite stunning where they've progressed to in the run of 40 or 50 or 55, 60 years. And what you would find at a typical co-op in the year 2021 would probably not look totally out of place if you pick that up and put it into a a rural community in on the prairies in Canada as far as what their you know product assortment and what their depth and breadth of inventory would look like. I'm particularly uh, I draw your attention particularly to the picture at the bottom left. And you know that particular picture is taken at a grand opening of a store in a community of about a thousand people. And you probably see 200 people outside. And probably the reason why you see only 200 people outside is the other 800 people fit inside. It's really a tremendous source of community pride. And the, you know, I sent, I circulated some, some different links to videos, et cetera, beforehand. And one of the directors of this particular co-op is in, um, in one of those videos and talks about the pride of something that belongs to the community. And uh, I know he would have been extremely proud as would his other community, members of his community, the day that this, that this, uh, that this store opened, opened in their community. So from those, again, from those humble beginnings, uh, the 32 member co-ops, there are now, you know, in excess, well in excess of 20,000 members. Uh, keep in mind that that doesn't necessarily equate one to one to people because a membership might be taken out on behalf of a family, that they would have one membership in the co-op and one vote in the direction of their co-op, but still could represent you know a household of two three four five or even more so uh, in most communities pretty much everybody through either their own membership or uh, through family living in the same household would be a member of of their of their co-op so the number of employees now numbers you know over a thousand and by our, by our statistics, over 85% are Indigenous and from the communities. So uh, maybe one of our biggest, our biggest areas of opportunity or biggest failings, depending on how you want to look at it, is we would envision, you know, we would aspire to have 100% of the, the employees of a local co-op being in and of the community. Uh, we're not there yet. There's certainly some, you know, capacity challenges with, uh, you know, with just training and, you know, these are small businesses. So it's one of the challenges is that because they're very small, biz very much small businesses, you know, nobody becomes the manager of a large volume grocery store in Southern Canada without having go gone through probably four, five, six or more career progressions along the way. So when you're operating in small businesses where they're so small that, you know, the cashiers might report directly to the general manager, it's very hard to have that gradual prog career progression. Uh, but that being said, we still don't lose sight of that as our, as you know, the, the future state that we aspire to, to help you know, reduce the, the economic leakage of outside employees uh, as much as possible. So the, the, the co-op system uh, pays now over $30, $30 million a year in wages uh, in the communities and they have accumulated assets in excess of $200 million and have member equity of over $110 million. And when you consider how few people we're really talking about here, to have assets retained wealth 
worth over $200 million in 60 years among only 22,000 people. And that, you know, some of it is financed, of course, because, you know, the member co-ops don't necessarily have cash over the barrel to, to fund multi-million dollar store projects, but they've retained, they've, the, the members themselves have equity of over $110 million. That is a stunning amount of wealth retained in the, in the communities um, by a lot of people that, that really otherwise really struggle from day to day. And I find it so gratifying to see how many member co-ops have things like pension programs for elders that, you know, that member equity that, you know, a, a member has basically contributed and, or, or, you know, built up over the years where they've, you know, either been able to, 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 to hunt and trap for sustenance and, or had a wage and supported their co-op. Now in turn, their co-op supports them by redeeming their member equity in a, in a, you know, in a monthly in a monthly pension, once they uh, once they you know reach a certain age, and you know that that is another manifestation of of concern for community and and autonomy and independence, where a co-op is looking after its elders by governing itself in such a way that it's able to to have those provisions for for people. So. Collective entrepreneurship. Uh, what might have started as the basic trade of of, of goods, usually usually uh, shelf stable goods back in the the fifties, late fifties and sixties, has now grown to include not just retail stores, but cable TV, petroleum delivery, restaurants, convenience stores. And this is not by no means uh, an all-inclusive list. There's, I think, three or four co-ops now that actually do the school busing in their community. Why would that be? Well, it's collective entrepreneurship. Together, the people have the means to buy a $100,000 bus where no individual would. So it's it's collective entrepreneurship uh, at its uh, you know at its core. So as member co-ops have diversified, so have the services of Arctic co-ops to meet to meet their needs. Um, one of the challenges of operating in remote small communities is that of scale. When you put it into perspective, our entire organization across 32 communities probably has similar combined volume to four or five good Walmarts. So scale is a challenge. And that is why co-ops saw fit to pool their volume to try to be more efficient with the delivery of services and do it through a cooperative enterprise you know, versus contracting contracting somebody to manage that for them. They've done it through a cooperative service federation that can be malleable and flexible to meet their evolving needs. And as those co-ops have diversified to try to achieve scale at the community level, they've seen fit to have Arctic co-ops expand the service offering to meet their evolving needs. So, you know, that's expanded to include what originally might have been strictly or largely a procurement and a logistics function back in 1972 has now expanded to include things like centralized IT accounting services. So, you know, accounting is an example of a service that is not readily available in many small communities, but they can provide it economically to one another. Uh, by working together through, through their service federation. Supply and logistics is a core function, human resources, operational support, art marketing, and, and many others. So I'll, I'll talk now, I've got a couple slides about, about the org chart. 
and or org charts. At a community level, a I always like, and you know, most people are familiar with the traditional presentation of an org chart, where it's shaped like a triangle or a pyramid, and at the top is a he or her that might have a title like CEO or you know chairperson or president, etc. And then you know it have the it would tree out to the various different functional areas of the business. I would prefer to, and I haven't found the perfect depiction yet. I'm still looking. But our org chart, whether it's at the individual community level or whether it's the service federation level, is shaped like an hourglass. So depending on the size of your community, if it's a if it's a community cooperative org chart like this depicts, you would have X number of individual members, could be 30 or 40 in a small community, could be 1,500 in a larger community. Our largest member co-op operates in Yellowknife. Uh, Yellowknife is a city of 16, 17, 18,000 people, and there's about 4,500 members. So depending on the size of the membership base, <clears throat> those members, one member, one vote, would elect a board of directors from among their peers, from among people. And it's not retired business types. It's people that use the services of their co-op, just like they do. And depending on the individual co-op's bylaws, that could, the number of directors is usually an odd number, usually seven or nine. And that board is accountable to their membership and their responsibility is to hire the general manager. And then the general manager is to make the operational decisions, the hiring or firing decisions to support the business. You know, and at that point, the org chart again is very similar to the traditional org charts that you know we would have seen or learned about in you know our organizational theory you know classes. Um, you know, various functional divisions of retail, hotel, etc. And the the position off on the left hand side dsa is is an acronym for district support advisor so that's a position that arctic co-op supports that essentially is a liaison not only between that supports the board of directors as it pertains to hiring appraising the general manager supports the the the, the directors on things like you know the, the the budget and long term long term you know five year plans etc. It's also a conduit for the co op whether it's on an operational matter or an operational perspective through the general manager whether it's from a governance perspective through the local co op board of directors to be a, a liaison back to the service federation. So it's you know when you're operating a, a business in a remote community and you're supported by a staff of 130 in a distant place, it might be hard to know where you go to get the support and service and help that you need. So the district support advisor really acts as that glue or that bridge that helps connect the local co-op back to the service and support that they need to meet their, to meet their needs. So much like I described the hourglass at the local co-op level, it's the same thing at Arctic co-ops because Arctic co-ops and Arctic co-op development funds are cooperative service federations owned by, instead of 22,000 members, or if you use the Yellowknife example, 4,500 members in a community, it's owned by 32 autonomous co-ops in this community of communities. And they elect a board of directors of seven, again, from among their peers. I talked earlier about that co-op principle of, of, you know, of uh, democratic member control, one member, one vote. Uh, our democratic structure set up in, in the bylaws of Arctic co-ops is actually one member, two votes. So each cooperative can send two delegates to the annual general meeting. And that is where uh, on a rotational basis, 
based on seven electoral districts, they will elect the local the the board of directors for Arctic co-ops. So the only people eligible to serve as a director of Arctic co-op, again, it's not retired business types that are hanging on to do something part-time. These are also directors of their local co-op. These are people that rely and use the services of the local co-op. So indirectly the services of Arctic co-ops on a regular, on a daily basis in their daily lives. So that is who hires the chief executive officer of Arctic co-ops. And then again, it fans out into the more traditional org chart because it still is a business and it still has many of the same functional needs that, you know, that, that traditional org chart would depict, whether it's for finance or for human resources, for IT, et cetera. So that's what our governance model looks like. And this is what our lovely board looks like. I spoke of, of the electoral districts and this is a little bit of a busy slide. So I'll apologize for that. But uh, the, districts, the districts are really trying to find that balance between common supply routes so that, you know, the co-ops within a district, you know, might be served by the same airline or might have their goods come out of the same, you know, up the same transportation lanes, might speak a similar language, and then trying to be equitable with the, the co-ops as far as, you know, each district representing a, a similar amount of business transacted uh, with the service federation so that there's a good balance that balanced in you know that the representation is 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 equitable now i'll uh i'll maybe stop there for questions i did th i always have at the end of my slide a few uh, slide decks a few interesting pictures about the uniqueness of operating in canada's arctic so uh, whether it's from a construction perspective or whether it's from the perspective of our logistics, because many outside audiences are often very intrigued with that aspect of, of what we face. So, uh, Pamela, I can be really flexible either way. If you want to, I can just do a quick page flip through those and a little bit of an explanation probably takes five six, seven minutes, and then we can go to questions or we can pause and take questions for as long, I will stay as long as there's questions. And then I will stay and do that afterwards too. I am very flexible to, to, to you know, while also respecting the timelines that, uh, that you've, you've uh, set as an expectation. Well, I, our group is kind of shy. I'm gonna have to get after everybody. Maybe um, I'm just dull. No, you're not dull. <laughs> I, I, and I've been getting people communicating with me and they're just like enthralled with what you're sharing and they're inspired by it. So I would say, just go ahead and keep going. Sure. One of the things I did want to ask you, are they still doing their materials, uh, their marketing materials bilingual? Uh, it's sort of trilingual actually. Okay. Um, there's there's really two there's really two types of especially in Nunavut where there's actually enacted language leg legislation uh, surrounding translation. There's two communities that use a dial a, a dialect called Inuinactin, which uses Roman orthography in its uh, in 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 that language and. The other communities with that use Inuktitut, which is uses syllabics in its in its language. So, depending on the community, <clears throat> or if it's a kind of a pan-territorial communication piece, there may be instances that it would be bilingual, but there could be others where it's trilingual. Okay. And I think if I went back, I could probably find some examples. Uh, yeah, no, there's no real good examples of uh, store decor that 
you know, would would include Inuktitut uh, in it. Um, you know, that's probably a, an opportunity for improvement in my in my in my presentation. But you know, thanks for that question. It's 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 a very relevant one. I love that they do that for their community because so many times this is why I've been, um, you know, with Arctic cooperatives. I just feel their model is so beautiful for other communities because of how they've really exercised sovereignty and self determination and that they've stayed true to their culture and, you know, to who they are as a people. So that has been so inspiring and, and this is such a beautiful presentation and you, you're really doing an awesome job. Well, you know, Pamela, I, I don't know what, the, what the, the tone and the context is in the, in the United States, but, you know, in Canada, you know, we've had, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to call it a buzzword, but, you know, there's been, whether it's the impact of colo you know, colonization uh, or, you know, other, other pretty bad things that have happened in our, in our nation's history as it pertains to, um, you know, treating Indigenous people. There's, there's a word, you know, the, the word reconciliation gets, mm -hmm. gets thrown out a little flippantly in, yeah. for, for, for my liking. Um, and I look at cooperative business as being, you know, and you, you touched on some of the, you know, uh, you know, food sovereignty, you know, but this is also, this is economic reconciliation mm -hmm. is what this is. And I, I some, I oftentimes wish I could find the thing to say or the thing to do to help inspire people to take the control that is right at their fingertips. And the reason I say that in the in, in the mar, in the communities that we serve, I'll, I'll use an example. So, Arctic Co-ops has 130 employees. They have 130 employees that live and work in a major urban center with a population of 850,000 people, and they're talented people, and they earn a wage. And then they take that and they do whatever they want with it. They pay rent, they pay their hydro bill, they pay, but they buy food just like, just like people in, in the North do. But then with their discretionary income beyond that, I bet you if you took 100 people that work at Arctic Co-ops and you could break down where their discretionary spending went, it would probably go a thousand different ways. There would be people that like trips. So they, they spend their money on trips. There's some that like shoes. There's some that like ethnic cuisine. There's some that like cars. There's some that like old cars. There's some that like new cars. There's some that like motorcycles. There's some that like gardening. There's some that like computers. There's some that like video games. There's some that, and their, their discretionary income goes a thousand different ways. They're a, of a diverse ethnic background. They're diverse age background, and that drives some of those some of those decisions. If you went to a remote mark remote community in Canada's Arctic, people's incomes are going into less fewer directions. They'll be buying goods at the northern store. They'll be buying goods at the co-op. They're paying their Northwest Tel bill. They're probably paying rent to Nunavut Housing, and you know, to maybe two or three other ways. So you've got a group of people. If you took a hundred people on average, that are now not spread out over a greater, great, you know, a metropolitan area, that are a lot more uniform with respect to their ethnic background. And if they simply made one, I talked earlier about the impact of scale. If they simply made one decision, 
to support their co-op versus the publicly traded company that's operating uh, a retail store in their community, they would be in a position to dramatically change their economic fortunes. Not in the short term, not tomorrow or not next week or not next month, but by achieving the greatest scale that they can within their community, doing it such that what they spend in their community doesn't take the form of economic leakage like it does with the publicly traded company. I shudder to think how much better and, and pricing with, with a social conscience as well, not pricing to maximize profits because the reason of being of the co-op is not to maximize profits. Does it need to be viable? Yes, it does. Does it need to maximize profits? No, it doesn't. And I think back to um, the last member co-op that was created was Old Crow Co-op back in uh, about 2015. And that particular community, there's about 230 people. Uh, they were not satisfied with what the publicly traded company was giving them from a price, from a quality, from an assortment perspective. And again, the publicly traded company is making decisions based on cost benefit, return on assets. And they're saying community of 230 people. Why would we invest in a community like that? We'll just keep milking the little asset that we've got there forever and ever and ever. And that wasn't satisfactory to the community. But when they when that, when that local board hired their general manager, the local board approves the budget. So the general manager was left with the instructions that said, okay, when you come back to present your budget, be mindful of this. Here's what we're looking to achieve. We want to have better nutrition for our kids. So bread, milk, eggs, produce, and meat, baby food, and baby supplies. And I, you know, I don't know what the exact list was, but I think you'll understand, you know, I'm hoping I'll be able to convey the principle of what I'm talking about. They said, we want you to make sure that stuff is affordable as possible. So when you come back with your budget, you, you know, tell us how that, how we can achieve that. So the manager came back with, with the budget that said, okay, I can do that, but it means that Tobacco is going to be an extra dollar a pack and bags of chips are going to be an extra 25 cents and pop is going to be an extra 10 cents and chocolate bars are going to be an extra 10 cents. And if you can live with that trade off, then I can do that for you. So that's what they did. Pricing with a social outcome, with a, a social outcome in mind, uh, with the nutrition of their kids and their grandkids in mind. And you know, I engage with the Nunavut Food Security Coalition, with Health Canada, with, you know, First Nations Inuit Health Branch of, of Health Canada, and they would often ask questions along those same lines that would say, okay, you know, it's the co-op, it's owned by the people, why don't you just double the price of pops and chips and tobacco and sell milk, bread, eggs and produce it and meat at no margin and voila, you're going to improve food security. And if you're the only store in town, in theory, you could make that work. But the reality is, is people still have choice and people still have the right to choose if they want to buy those other goods. And if you price yourself uncompetitively on those goods and only sell the goods that you're giving away at no margin, you might as well order padlocks and chains for the doors with your next order because you're not going to be viable. You remember back to the initial, you know, some of the early part of the presentation where we talked about the basic premise of the co-op pricing model is to sell goods at market competitive prices and to return the surplus to the member owners in the form of patronage and cashback. So what I haven't found yet is what it takes to have people realize, you know, we believe that people they shouldn't feel like they're making a compromise or making a sacrifice to buy at their local co-op, that the prices should be competitive. The store should be as clean. The store should be as well stocked. The service should be as good. The hours should be as good. And if you do those things, if you do the business right, why would people choose to shop anywhere else than the store 
the gas bar, the whatever it is that they own and they can control, where the benefits of that ultimately manifest itself in two ways. One is retained wealth in their community for them and collectively. And if it's very successful, actually a patronage dividend and cash back based on their purchases into their pocket. I haven't found that recipe yet, but it doesn't mean we stop trying. Thank you. Well, let's see your photos that you have. Sure. So this is, this is a, a picture of a store under construction. You might not believe it, but one of the, one of the capacity constraints in you know, many of these communities is heavy equipment. You know, you don't just rent a crane or buy a, buy a piece of equipment to, you know, help erect your, your facility because they don't exist. So we choose a particular building type that actually bolts together. So when you see this building go up, uh, the, the walls are kind of self-supporting because they're corrugated. You know, the corrugation is probably about a foot deep. But once you bolt them together, and then once you bolt together the roof system, there's probably hundreds of thousands of bolts in, in, this, uh, in this building. You get the structural rigidity that you need and also be able to have uh, clear spans. So the trusses you can see on this are uh, bolted together. And as they build panel by panel, they will just be able to do it without heavy equipment using scaffolding and moving moving along till uh, up until uh, completion. Uh, I talked about, about some of the air logistics and you know you could fit Europe, you could probably fit Europe within, within Canada and you're flying planes of all different gauges and types to uh, a variety of airstrips. So, you know, we would use aircraft ranging from as small as a Pilatus PC-12 that you'd see on the right hand top right hand side, which you know might haul 1,800 pounds worth of freight, up to and including uh, you know the Boeing 767 uh, 300, which is the largest commercial aircraft uh, used in the country, and can haul. I think the max payload is about 126,000 pounds, which to equate into semi-tractor trailer loads would be about the equivalent weight of three average uh, semi-tractor trailer loads uh, of food and, and, and everything in between. The, the, you know, the, some of the, the variables that we would work with in, would include the length of the runway, whether it's hard serviced or gravel, the size of the community, and many aircraft are what's called combis. So the one you see in the bottom left, you know, airlines deal with the same challenges of scale. So one of their reactions or one of their models is to try to achieve that scale by having passengers and, and freight on the same aircraft, because neither market is big enough to support uh, a dedicated freighter service or a dedicated passenger service with the frequency that's desired. So oftentimes freight is delivered on combis, we call them. So if you look at the aircraft in the center, that's, the, that's an example of a Boeing 737 combi. And if you look at the, you can see the cargo door opened. You can see what's called the FMC, which would lift, uh, lift the cargo up to the height of the door. But if you notice the back 12 or so uh, windows are lit. So this particular aircraft is a combi. You can see the stairs at the back. So there would be about 12 rows of passengers at the back of this aircraft and freight in front. And what you see on the top right is a typical roller floor in a, in a large freighter aircraft that, uh, that the cargo can just roll in and lock down. The vast majority of the communities are coastal communities, so they would get uh, marine service. So annual deliveries between one and three deliveries with uh, an ocean going container ship. 
I think just for just for scale and reference, uh, I'll maybe draw your attention to both of these pictures. If you look at the picture on the top, on the top, and you look really, really, if you squint really hard, you'll see uh, a barge sitting beside the the vessel with a dump truck on it. And if you look at how small that that dump truck looks in in comparison, you get a little bit of a sense of the scale of the of the vessel. And likewise, on the bottom one, you can see stacked on top of the cargo towards the towards the bridge at the back uh, is uh, pickup trucks and other passenger vehicles. So, you know, there's it's stacked it's stacked above deck. You know, at least at least four vehicles high. And this is this is uh, the Bellet Strait, and if anyone wants to Google it, this this is really considered um, probably the de facto Northwest Passage, and it's not very wide and it's not very well charted. But since 2008, we've been trans we've been hauling cargo from uh, marine cargo from Eastern Canada through to the Western Arctic uh, through the the Bellet Strait successfully and you know while we might hope for waters like this sometimes we get this and need a coast guard icebreaker escort to to reach a community uh, i talked about collective entrepreneurship and the co-ops working together to to self provide them with goods and services that they need i think this is an example of that you'll see the co-op logo on these uh groovy red containers uh, collectively, individually, the co-ops own no containers other than what they might have in their community for cold storage, but collectively they own about 1,200 containers. So they're able to be more efficient by self-serving themselves with a revolving fleet of containers to meet their, their annual need for, uh, for, for goods via marine resupply. The vessels themselves need to because there's very little infrastructure in the community, they need to be self-sufficient. So the vessels would take with them uh, tugboats and barges like you'd see here. So they would set anchor and offload the tugs, offload the barges. What you see the, the deckhand standing on on the barge is uh, ramps so that they can offload cargo at shore. They would bring their own loaders uh, to to, to handle the cargo and then they will in essence the the tug and barge will put will go back and forth back and forth between the vessel and the shore to to offload the cargo for the community and it could be everything from those 20 foot sea cans that we saw we saw pickup trucks we saw dump trucks it'd be housing material and literally everything in between so the 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 containers and the other cargo are offloaded using using uh, cranes aboard the vessel. And then here's an example of how far in this particular community, how far they need to set anchor offshore. And you can see the loader and the ramps that that would be how the ca cargo is offloaded at, at the shore and placed above the high water mark so that it's not impacted by the tides. And while we hope for this, Sometimes we get this and it, it's pretty harsh doing mar marine cargo. Uh, this, the marine cargo season lasts until usually about the first week of November, but it's getting, it's getting pretty risky once you get into late October, early November to be operating in, in Canada's Arctic. So these, these guys and gals do a pretty admirable job. And if anyone's interested, uh, if you want to Google high Arctic haulers, uh, there's a seven or eight part series about our marine resupply on uh, on CBC Gem. So you know anyone can go and take a look at uh, at uh, at that series and just see what what some of the uh, some of the the realities of doing. Uh, marine cargo in Canada's Arctic looks like. So I would encourage anyone that's interested that might want to to take a look at that. And with that, the sun is setting on my time uh, that's been allotted. It's 4.30. But as I said, uh, I'm, 
I'm ready, willing, and able to, to stay on for as long as there's questions. Thank you, Pamela and Justin. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have, you can unmute and ask questions. Please don't be shy. We're really lucky to have this uh, presentation today and um, Boy, it's be a good way to get your questions answered or something that you're curious about. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, first, I want to say thank you for hosting this and thank you for being here. This is just a lot to, to think about, which is awesome. Um, so I wanted to know a little bit, where are, I'm seeing like the shipping containers, are these products international or are they kind of coming from the same place? You, you had mentioned like just the rotating cargo mm -hmm. um, uh, cargo crates. Where, where exactly are they coming from? Other parts of Canada or are they coming from, like internationally? Yeah, sure, I can, I can answer that. Um, you know, I, I talked earlier about scale, and one of the one of the and, and the lack of scale that exists in 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 these communities. So, what happens is the co-ops would prepare orders uh, for the marine shipping season, and then we've got a contracted. It's called a marshaller, but it's basically a freight forwarder close to the port of departure, so that. In essence, the service they provide is to, you know, we would consolidate uh, products by supplier inbound to the freight forwarder. And then their responsibility is to repackage that cargo by community. So, you know, there might be a, let's take for, let's just make it really simple. If 24 co-ops all ordered one pallet of pens we could ship a full truckload of pens to the to the freight forwarder who would then take that full truckload and load it into 24 different containers bound for 24 different communities but obviously you don't want to send one 20-foot container with only one pallet of pens in it so they do that for all of the suppliers so that they are basically inbound the product can be sent in as efficiently as possible by aggregating and, and consolidating the orders. But then there's this intermediate step where then it's then separated by community and packed with other goods from other suppliers going to the same community and would get loaded onto the marine vessel and for transportation to the community. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Thank you. I have a tag along question if no one else wants to jump in. Go for it. Okay, so I'm, um, we've seen with COVID, especially in the United States, kind of the way our, um, um, uh, like our distribution networks, our, our supply chains and distribution networks have really kind of fallen apart. I, I really like these, um, the cooperative models that you're talking about, because cooperatives have, you know, have been around as an idea, but cooperatives in the hands of First Nations, Native people especially, is, is a really um, powerful phenomenon in and of itself. And I, and I think that it's kind of radically um, shifting the way that we sort of envision what economy and what wealth looks like. Um, so I, I like the cooperative model because it, it seems to sort of chain link resources together rather than you know focusing on one resource and trying to make that the top of each individual little pyramid and then hoping it all kind of comes together for select people who can you know jump through all of the right hoops. But what I wanted to know was how, how well has this cooperative model just in terms of like the, the supply chains and distribution networks, how well has that buffered against some of the um, kind of rippling effects of, of COVID? Okay, I'll take, a, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, 
uh, and you know my answer will probably have <clears throat> kind of three different three different uh, lenses to it. One is I would say the communities of Canada's Arctic were somewhat insulated from some of the supply chain issues that COVID has brought on because of the fact that they rely on a, you know, a single large marine shipment to meet a lot of their needs for you know, non-perishable products. So I'll use, I'll, let's use toilet paper as an example, because toilet paper is probably, you know, the most, you know, the most visible and, 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 you know, most broadly recognized anecdotal impact of, of, of a COVID supply chain really early on in the, in the pandemic. Nobody in Canada's Arctic communities knew about, con, were concerned about that because they knew every co-op and the Northern were not, you know, the, they would have operated the same way, had a year's worth of it in their back room because they would have sent it in by sea because it's non-perishable. So unless COVID changed how much people were using toilet paper, they didn't need to worry about running out because it was already there. So, you know, I guess that's the, the first aspect of it. The second aspect is co-ops, especially in, you know, in, in these sorts of communities where I've talked about the challenge of scale. So they're, they're challenged with, with respect to scale. So, you know, it's not like they are direct importing full containers of, of anything. And so they would really be subjected to a lot of the same difficulties that, that you know, businesses across Southern Canada and throughout the United States have seen as, as part of the supply chain. So they would have some of those same uh, impacts you know, especially on goods that weren't already preloaded because of because of the, the marine shipping season. However, I would say that there is more resiliency baked into the, or there is more capacity built into the model because of the service and support of our procurement team. That if there's a shortage of a good, let's call it toilet paper, we can be more efficient at seeking out alternate supply, seeking out uh, alternate transportation arrangements, et cetera, than any individual co-op could be on its own. And I'll, I'll, I'll use an example. So on or about October the 13th, the largest fly-in community in our country, the city of Iqaluit, was placed under a water advisory. And it wasn't just a boil water advisory. There was uh, petroleum, trace petroleum in their water. So it was a strict do not consume order for washing, for cooking, for and it wasn't just boil it and it'll be fine. So because of this, the financial capacity and the logistical capacity of this organization, within eight days, and starting, that was, I think, a Wednesday. So starting by the Friday, we probably delivered 800,000 bottles of water to this community of 8,000 people within eight days through a combination of scheduled service that we already had, additional air charters. We brought in an Airbus A330 from Portugal where you have to write a check for $650,000 US before the thing even turns. Um, because we could, because together the co-ops had built this capacity to, to do that logistical capacity, procurement capacity and financial capacity. So, you know, I know that's a little bit taking it to an extreme, but I think it's an example of how you know, that particular supply chain was a problem because there was a sudden shift in how people drank water. But if that sudden shift meant there was an absolutely essential to life good that was not available, we have alternate means through our procurement and through our logistics 
to, you know, we obviously can't wave a magic wand and make something that doesn't exist, but if it's moving something that might be available in a different place than it might traditionally be, we can do that. If it means buying something from a different supplier than you've always gone to because you know, supplier X has it available when supplier Y doesn't. We've got the means to hunt that down and acquire that good. So, uh, I, you know, I know that that uh, it's it's certainly not a magic wand that that makes the supply chain challenges go away. I, I wouldn't be so bold as to suggest that, but it certainly gives some means and some capacity to compensate for the traditional supply chain to ensure that people's needs are met and you know flying a 275 million dollar plane from portugal to move water to a caloit is a pretty bold step that there's not many organizations outside of government could have done or would have done and i'll maybe just add on to that um out of concern for community after all the costs were tallied and they were shared open book with the government who gave us the PO to, to do this, we charged an administration fee of $1. And I know when, you, when in an emergency situation, I think there's lots of organizations that rub their hands together and they think they've got a blank check when they've got a government purchase order and they rub their hands and they take full advantage. But when you put that concern for community lens on, we can hold our head high and be very proud that we did the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I like what you're talking about here because it's it's thinking outside of terms of um, it's more than just amassing a you know a, a stockpile a, a, a secret warehouse somewhere that has all of the toilet paper. You know, it's it's more than this than just trying to be um, completely impenetrable to to hardship or to circumstances or, you know, global pandemics or global diseases. It's, it's about being able to, um, to move through those challenges and being able to pivot very quickly and kind of close those gaps. So if, if something has to change, like how you were saying that the eight days, that's a really quick turnaround. That's a very quick turnaround. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, make more of this than it is. But, uh, you know, that happened, I think it was on a Wednesday and we had, I think we moved 40,000 pounds on a scheduled flight Friday. We moved 100, 103,000 pounds on a chartered flight Friday. We knew, moved another 50,000 pounds on a chartered flight Sunday and, and on and on for, for, for eight days. Um, but, the city of Iqaluit has no recycling program. And it would have been really easy to just put our head down and say, we're too busy. But, you know, we looked at what we had and, you know, the pictures that I showed from the Maritime Shipping Company were the largest shareholder in that company. And I talked about how the co-ops owned this fleet of containers. Well, we happened to have a vessel southbound in the bay at exactly at that time that we could offload empty containers. So we did. And we communicated with the city, put it out on social media, encouraged people to keep and crush their plastic bottles. And we filled five sea cans full of crushed plastic bottles in about two weeks. And now we're actually working with the city and the government of Nunavut for additional empty sea cans that they might have around the community. And we're going to do more. And I can assure you, it's not for the good of our health. As somebody who works 1,400 miles away from a Callaway. And it's not for economic gain, because this is a net, this is a net lose proposition. But I talked about how you use the co-op principles as lenses to make 
decisions that aren't strictly quantitative decisions. This was a qualitative decision that said, you know what? By the time it's all said and done, we spent set, probably sent 1.4 million plastic bottles into that community. One, and that's, you know, we weren't the only ones. You can't tell me that sending 1.4 million extra plastic bottles doesn't change something with the equilibrium of what their solid waste management looks like. So we took stock of what we had to work with and basically recycled as much of that as we could because we could and because we're a co-op and because it's a manifestation of concern for community. And, you know, it's something that I'm, I'm pretty proud of. And, uh, you know, and when it, when it changed, when, when you use the seven co-op principles as different lenses by which to make decisions, you end up with different decisions. And I think you end up with better decisions in the long run. You know, I, I, I went through an exercise for our board, well, this is probably a year and a half ago now, uh, about overlaying the co-op principles with, um, with uh, the UN's uh, sustainable development goals. You know, so this is, this is globally, I think it's about 17 things aimed at sustainable development goals for the planet. And it wasn't hard to make a lot of linkages back to seven co-op principles. And if we're a business and if we're an organization that is managing what we do, governing our, you know, Guy, having our decisions guided by the seven co-op principles, then I think it only stands to reason that we are more aligned with those sustainable development goals, which means we're more aligned with a more sustainable planet. And, you know, that's, uh, that's I think, if I think about our stakeholders, Indigenous people in Canada's remote Arctic, stewards of the land, people that derive their livelihood from the land. Um, you know, obviously the connection to Mother Earth is important to them, which makes it important to us. And now the important thing is helping people connect those things together so that they're they that consumers, co-op members are making different decisions with their economic, the economic decisions that they're making every day in the community to achieve that scale because our capacity to do some of these things that might not be economically viable on their own is a function of our economic capacity to do it. So the more support we're able to get shopping at the co-op, for example, the more recycling we're able to do, the more end of life vehicles we're able to bring back, the more patronage dividends and general cash repayments that individual co-op members can, can would enjoy to improve their economic, their food security situation and on and on and on. I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> Thank you. No, we, I could listen to this for so long because it's, you know, I, I like um, native led examples, indigenous examples. I like, you know, as a US citizen examples from other countries um, and, you know, thinking about spaces that especially up near that Arctic circle, that's, that's really a space that I, I've been thinking a lot about. So I'm, I'm located um, in the Great Lakes area. And so when I think about this region, I really think about um, like the transition from like a two to four season, uh, a living environment, but that whole longitude around the planet where, where, where I'm at right now is really kind of um, a major buffer zone for maintaining that health of the Arctic Circle. So when I think about climate change and the impact of pollution and, and all these kinds of things, and even the freighters, you know, that they're 
or not the yeah the the ships that are carrying cargo containers are able to access those um the um the parts of the arctic circle that were frozen for longer parts of the year are now unfrozen and so it's things are drastically changing in that space and when you think about the um impact on the planet we're talking about the the entire planet's water supply goes mm -hmm. through that space and so when we are talking about um, native people as original stewards of the land we also have to envision too like maintaining that space on the planet has been for the benefit of everybody so to see native communities thriving with an economic model you know it it's not just yes there's that that 3D physical part of the land, but the people too, um, and they're the social fabric of the people and you know the, the language and all of those kinds of things, that's all part of it. And that can't be parceled apart from climate resiliency and um, bouncing back from changes in our, in our global climate. So I really like hearing about what's going on in the Arctic Circle because this is really kind of the tip of the spear in sort of reimagining global economies and then we can see that these models work in such a crucial crucial part of the planet right especially right now um i i just think i it just i don't know it gives me so much hope especially in, in sharp sharp deep contrast to what's going on near the e equator of our planet with the amazon and the logging and i mean yes we have those things where i'm at you know in, in my state part of the planet too but um in terms of that clash between indigenous and and native people that didn't get treaties and don't necessarily have those kinds of rights and are really kind of up against some of the extremes of, of physical violence especially from the state from these private corporations from these security companies um and on top of living with the um the effects of you know the logging and the, and the, the direct pollution and the runoff all of that that comes from those kinds of activities that's such, such a sharp, sharp contrast as to what's going on with what you're talking about here in, in the Arctic. And not that the Arctic is completely <laughs> without, you know, oil drilling. And I mean, there's there's problems everywhere right now. But I like to see these, um, I like to see that there are some areas that are kind of holding that vanguard, if that makes any mm -hmm. sense. So thank you, because this, this preserving um, these ways of life for the original stewards, it, it helps all of our waterways, every single drop of water on the planet goes through the Arctic Circle. And so the more that that can be maintained, the more that these original stewards can be maintained in holding that line for us, that's what's going to really determine whether our species can make it, <laughs> can make it. So I, I like that Native people and the sovereignty of Native people are really at the forefront and center of these conversations. Yeah, and you know, very well said. I, you know, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to add anything, anything to that. Thank you for, for sharing it. One, one thing that I think that, um, you know, I, I talked about the challenge of scale, and you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be, I don't want to be, you know, uh, you know, leave you with any impressions that, you know, it's not a challenge operating a small autonomous co-op in in Canada's Arctic, you know, there's, there's ups and downs with, uh, you know, with, with the business and the, and the cooperative. And, you know, oftentimes they rely on one another for their, you know, for, for that resiliency. But, you know, thinking back to some of what, uh, you know, Pamela was sharing about the start at the start about, you know, some, some communities in, in, in your country that are in, de facto food deserts and you know I, I don't know the circumstances that are bringing that on but if there's if there's companies that are you know not willing to come uh, i i think about about one of the roles of the service federation is to de-risk these autonomous co-op businesses so whether that's by helping to promote good governance whether that's to help to to help you know with financial systems so that they can meet their obligations and better manage their inventory etc 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 but i think three key things that helps secure the supply chain you know is the able to the ability to make a long-term commitment 
which many member co-ops independently cannot do because of the ups and downs of their, their business, but can be done on their behalf as a, as a collective. The other is stable and predictable volumes. Again, individually, co-ops have their volumes for products, et cetera, go you know, vary quite a bit. Collectively, they can have stable and predictable volume. And the third is the ability to pay. So again, with those ups and downs, Arctic Co-op supports co-ops through their ups and downs that individually, at any moment in time, there might be some that wouldn't have the ability to pay for goods, to pay for the services that they need. So by working collectively, Arctic Co-ops is, can be the glue that helps co-ops weather those ups and downs because collectively, they can provide stable and predictable volume, the ability to make a long-term commitment and the ability to pay. And those three things are key parts, especially in the area of transportation with, with airlines and ships. Those are key elements that make the whole thing work on a more sustainable basis. I'll take it over capitalism. <laughs> Uh, collective entrepreneurship. Duane, we want to thank you so much um, and for extending your time with us today. Uh, this has been such a really a beautiful presentation and I, I can't wait to watch it again. So I, I'm just really thankful. I'm really thankful to um, the Center for Rural Affairs for hosting this space and partnering to, you know, to do this together. And I know that Justin had a link in here for people. I, we, we need to get Justin off the phone. They've got tornadoes touching down all around where he's at right now. Ooh. So, um, but there's a link in here for people to fill out an evaluation. It will really help. And then we'll be able to follow up with you with the, um, with the video so that you can, um, you'll know where it's at. And then we'll also be hosting this video um, with uh, uh, the Minnesota Indigenous Business Alliance's uh, YouTube page as well for all of our, you know, Native Nation members because they come and check things out all the time. And um, if anyone is interested in learning more about cooperatives, we're really happy to have a conversation with you. And, um, you know, to be able to really think these things through. And I know that the success that the Arctic Cooperatives has, this has been done over years, but it's been a consistent, you know, to me, I look at, this is something we can all aspire to have for our communities and to take control instead of always be beholden to um, the federal government to sort out our problems, but for us to be use self-determination and go, we're going to create our own development fund. We're not going to have to deal with those banks that have very racist attitudes towards our people. And we can start building our own money and we can fund our own projects in our communities. And it's another way I love the collective entrepreneurship because, uh, you know, and our tribes, you know, our nations here in the, you know, in the U.S. have the ability to, um, they can actually form, I don't want to call it a treaty, but they can form federation agreements between nations and do nation to nation sharing. And I, I just see this, your model, you know, every time I've looked at it is something that could really be replicated really well in several of our areas where we've got this remoteness and we have these large land bases at that, you know, how do we take care of our communities? And we have large land base, uh, you know, reserves, reservations in Minnesota. And sometimes to drive from one community to the next, and of course it's probably nothing, this is kind of probably like, would be like really a piece of cake for you know the folks up north in your area, but you know you figure you have to drive 60 miles. Um, most of our people have to drive 60 miles one way to get goods. 
Um, and so they're not there in our communities. And this kind of a model can really help us, you know, become more self-sufficient and not so reliant on everybody else in those big box stores that are just, you know, they and, and are, you know, I, one of the things that I feel so strongly about is leakage because the things that we do with our hands, you know, that we create, it just seems to leak out of our communities and it makes another community stronger. And, and sometimes we don't have a good relationship with that outside community, but their economies benefit by us. And it's like, why aren't we doing this for ourselves? So I just really, really want to thank you for, um, oh my gosh, you're such a great presenter and you just laid everything out so beautifully and so clearly. So I just want to say wado, miigwech, wokida, you know, thank you for um, being with us today. And I'll let you take it over, Justin, because I, I want you to get in a safe place. <laughs> We've got some crazy weather right now. We did. Um, some of the Nebraska folks who are, who are on the call had to leave to, to take some shelter, but it, it looks like it's moved out of the area now. So um, I, I did want to thank Dwayne as well. Um, this is an incredible presentation, um, very in-depth, and we're, we're just looking forward to sharing it uh, with our audiences here in, in Nebraska and, and all over all over North America as well. So thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, yeah, take care, stay safe. Yes. And, and yes, Pamela mentioned it, but I'll put it in the chat one more time. We do have an evaluation. There's a link to it. It shouldn't take more than a couple minutes and it, it really helps us improve our programs. So and we'll let I, you get going, Dwayne, because we know you have to be somewhere too. So you yeah. can go ahead and hang up. You Thank want. you. And if uh, if you'd be so kind, if you think that the if you think that the uh, contents of the evaluation are suitable to share, I always aspire to make this better. So I'm I'm open open to to constructive feedback or criticism, and uh, always with the always with the goal of continual improvement. Well, everybody have a beautiful evening and stay safe for any of those that are down in Nebraska. It's thank you, coming everybody. Our way in a little bit. So, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, Take everybody. Care. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Justin. Oh, you poor guy. Just yeah. go take care of yourself. I'm going to run to the store before it gets bad here. Sounds good. Yeah. Good luck. I hope you guys don't get hit too hard. It was. Yeah, I had to disengage a little bit there just to pay attention. Yeah, yeah. that's okay. I, I, um, what a great presentation. Oh, yeah. yeah, it it was. And yeah, just really thankful, like I said, so in depth. Um, yeah, and then really looking forward to hearing from RJ as well. Oh, yeah, that, that'll be really fun. And then um, Koala. And Koala. So um, I'll get I'll get word out to everybody about Koala for Friday. And um, we'll, we'll go from there. So you take care and stay safe. You too. You too. Right. Thank you, Pamela. Good night. Bye.